Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Sid Meier's Civilization VI. In this video, I'm trying something a little different. I'm gonna, I'm going for more of a guide format here, and I think you're really gonna like it if you're looking to learn a little bit more about the game. So stick with me here. Uh, this guide or this little series is gonna be about Australia, and Australia is, in my opinion, absolutely brokenly strong still. They got a nerf, like a slight nerf to their land down under, but it's not enough by any means. They are super strong, super, super strong, Civ, because basically the reason being they have incredibly powerful bonuses and very general core bonuses. What I mean by core bonuses is they don't have some, like, it's not faith or something like that, it's not tourism, it's not maybe like situational wonders. They just have these raw bonuses, these food production and housing bonuses that are always relevant and like general adjacency that are always relevant and they're super powerful throughout all stages of the game. So I'm going to go through their bonuses one by one and basically explain why, uh, how you should use them, why they're strong, some possible disadvantages, although Australia has very few of those. And yeah, so I'm going to go through it one by one here. So the main, uh, I'll start with land down under, right? Land down under, plus three housing and coastal cities. Pastures trigger a culture bomb. Yields from campuses, commercial hubs, holy sites, and theater squares. So the better way to read that is yields from all districts except industrial and harbors are plus one in charming tiles and plus three in breathtaking tiles. And if you're not super familiar with appeal as a game concept, I can go through it right now. Uh, small tip here, if you click down here on lenses, you can change your lens to whatever, like appeal. And you can also use your keyboard. So like, uh, you use the numbers. So if you press one, it opens religion. Press two, it opens continent, appeal, whatever. But anyway, so for appeal, the way appeal works is, it's a little tricky, but a, a tiles base appeal is, zero i'm pretty sure it's either one or zero i apologize for not knowing offhand a base appeal of a tile is zero i'm, I'm pretty sure um feel free to double check that for me if you want but anyway if you mouse over a tile like this like what i'm doing right now it's telling me grassland owner movement cost whatever and it says appeal average one so that's how you can check it apart from this lens here the way appeal works is the base is zero, and then certain terrain features around that tile influence the appeal. So, for example, a river gives it plus one appeal. A mountain gives it plus one appeal if it's adjacent to a mountain. Natural wonder gives it plus two. And it's mostly positive bonuses, but things that bring it down are mines, encampments, quarries, and industrial zones. And rainforest, I think... Yeah, Rainforest, definitely. And if you can't keep track of all this, you can always just go to the Civilopedia here and type Appeal, and it will show you the Appeal bonuses. So, plus two to Natural Wonder, plus one. Oh yeah, some of your districts boost it, like Theater Squares boost it, Mountains, uh, Freshwater, certain improvements, and yeah, minus one for Pillage Tiles, minus one for Mines, etc., etc. So, why is this relevant to the game in any way, shape, or form? Well, first of all, it affects neighborhoods. So, a neighborhood, uh, the amount of housing you get is based on the appeal, so that's important. It also affects national parks. Uh, national parks, you can buy with faith late in the game, and they give you a ton of tourism. So, they're pretty important if you're going for a cultural victory. And so, you need to, it's based on a certain amount of appeals for, appeal for the tile. Um, the total tourism you get is equal to the total appeal of the four tiles you get. Uh, uh, of the four tiles you use for the park, is what I should say. And, but anyway, that's a little bit of digression. So relevant to Australia, appeal affects this bonus, right? Uh, appeal, you get a plus one for a district in, in Charming, which is at least two. And then plus three for Breathtaking, which is at least four at least four appeal. So let's check this out. If you do go to the appeal lens, 
these uh, like sort of light green is charming. So this one is two charming, and dark green or I'm sorry, like bright bright green here is breathtaking. So this example here, bless breathtaking four, it's getting plus one for this uh, woods here, plus two for this natural wonder, and I believe a luxury is giving it the fourth here. So that's a total of four. Whereas for this like charming tile here, it's getting it starts at zero, right? It gets plus one, plus two, plus three for the two mountains and the woods. And then this is actually a floodplains tile, which is a minus one to appeal. So plus one, plus two, plus three, minus one is a total of two, which is charming. So um, you actually don't really I know it's a little complicated doing all this little math this math to figure that out. But the thing is, you can first of all, you can check it with the lens very quickly. Oh, yeah, charming. And when you're placing a district, um, you can pay attention to the adjacency bonuses. And so I'm going to give you an example of why this is so good. Because first of all, it's really not hard to get these bonuses, right? There, there are terrain features everywhere that you can boost, that, that can boost your appeal. There's plenty of mountains, plenty of woods, plenty of fresh water. It's pretty easy to get a, a good number of breathtaking and um, charming tiles. And there's really no downside, right? There's no downside. This just happens. So here's an example, right? So I put this little sun uh, pin to represent a campus, a future campus. So a campus here, right? Plus one uh, vanilla campus just has zero adjacency. But okay, here we go. You get plus one from a mountain, plus two from a mountain. That is two adjacency. And then this tile... Oops, this tile is breathtaking, which means it gets another plus three. So literally as soon as I tech writing here, all I have to do is is buy this tile, um, which will probably only take, you know, I'll only have to buy one because it should grow to the luxury pretty quickly. I'll just buy this tile and bam, I have a plus, I have a uh, plus five campus, just like that. I was just playing a game as Australia, literally like, as soon as I got writing and I bought one tile, I plopped on a plus seven campus because there were mountains and then it was breathtaking. So that's just an example, a plus five campus right away in my first city. And I can go find another city and hey, I'll probably get a plus four campus. I'll probably get another one. Like this is not that hard to get if you see what I'm saying here. And this, let's say um, I won't be in my first city, but if I wanted to put a holy site here, yeah, this is like a little bit of a weird example because there's a natural wonder. But it would be plus four from the natural wonder, plus one from the mountain, and plus uh, three from the breathtaking. So what is that? Four plus five. So that's plus eight for a holy site. Like, that's just insane. But let's say I didn't have a natural wonder, right? I could still, like, hey, you know, this isn't the best. But let's say I want to put it here. I get plus one from the my holy site here by the river, plus one from the woods, and plus plus one from the charming tile so hey just a little bit extra and i can do that with like pretty much every district i'll ever build in the entire game so it, it's it's consistently gives you like it's a consistent small and very very often it gives you these massive bonuses like your science can go out of control as australia like because if you just plant a few of these campuses you don't even need libraries or anything like a plus five adjacency is the equivalent of a university that's the equivalent of a late medieval era i'm sorry it's more than a university it's the equivalent of a late medieval era 250 production building in science right away as soon as i plant my first district like that's that's just crazy so as you can see this applies to commercial hubs this applies to campuses theater squares holy sites it doesn't apply to industrial zones thank god uh because that would be so freaking overpowered i mean it already is freaking overpowered but anyway, so you might be wondering, like, I, I think I've made it clear that this is an incredibly powerful bonus. Mm, but here's the thing. It does have one little, uh, a small downside, right? So I already went over appeal. Appeal. Plus one, plus one, yeah, yeah, yeah. Plus one for whatever uh, you're adjacent to. We also have these minuses, right? Industrial zone. Uh, spaceport. Not that that's relevant. Marsh. And the biggest one here is mines and quarries. Because in the early game, I actually, mines are, are the best improvements, generally speaking. Like, farms are kind of meh. Farms just, like, supply your, 
city with enough population to work your mines, if that makes sense. It's really all about the mines, the production, the lumber mills, and the, the quarries and stuff. So here's the thing. If I, like I said, I'll just use this um, campus as an example, right? Hey, campus. Heck yeah, I'm getting plus, plus five, baby. Like plus five here. But wait a second. What if I want to build some mines? Because I, of course I want mines. Uh-oh, all of a sudden... If I'm going to improve my luxury and I want to work this mine, this really nice plains mine, all of a sudden I'm bringing this tile's appeal down by two. And so it goes from, hello, it goes from breathtaking down to charming. So all of a sudden I'm losing plus two science if I build these two mines. So that's a good example of actually the downside of this. But here's the thing, it's not exactly a downside, it's just a situation where the bonus is smaller. But here's the thing, you're fully in control of this, right? Like, you're fully in control of whether you want to make the choice of building this mine or of getting the plus two science. So it still gives you options. It's just it's just kind of a, a damper on it here. And it's pretty easy to play around it. Because they're, they're, if you have a lot of planes, like, your mines are much less urgent. Like, if you have a lot of production from planes, you can kind of get away without building that many mines, especially in the early game. Like... If I want to build a mine here, right, three tiles away, well, I'm going to need a pretty big population. First of all, I'm going to need three rings to get out this mine over here. I'll just delete this one, because obviously I want to get the luxury. That's a no-brainer. Um, let's say I want to build the, work this mine, right? I need three rings. I need to grow my borders, and I, I need to like not be working this mine, this mine, this quarry, this mine, and this mine, this farm, this lumber mill, like hey, I can live without this mine for a little while, right? At least until at least until the super late game where my cities are massive. Like, hey, I can live without this mine. I'll take the plus two science, you know what I mean? So it's fairly easy to play around that. Um, other things like industrial zones and encampments. First of all, encampments don't get any adjacency bonuses, so I can stick my encampment wherever the hell I want. I can stick it way the hell away from all my other districts like i don't care like sure it can it can give you a like a minor adjacency if it's adjacent to other districts but it doesn't really matter where the encampment is um like positioning military positioning aside like i can stick my encampment like way the hell down here like who cares i don't need it to d disrupt my my districts up there it doesn't really matter and then industrial zones i went over this like in in a playthrough i've gone over this before industrial zones kind of suck um and in general um and i won't talk about i won't go into detail about that right now but just in my opinion industrial zones are very weak districts um uh, most of the time it depends on city states i'll talk about that on another day but in, in terms of industrial zones um you are discouraged from building them as australia but that's honestly okay because they're kind of bad um they're not really worth the investment and here's the thing if you want to build an industrial zone you're going to want to build it like near some mines, right? So you kind of want to, if you're going to go ahead and build an industrial zone, I mean, you should build one that's like clustered around your city so that if you build a factory, it's boosting many cities. So that's a, a situation where you do want an industrial district always. But let's say I do want to build one, right? I mean, I can just build that one. I can build that here. It's industrial zone. And it's getting like, I want to put it next to mines because industrial zones get boosted by mines and quarries. So this industrial zone will be plus three. And I'm just keeping it, and yes, this mines and this industrial zone will like, will um slow down. It'll it'll reduce the appeal over here. But that's okay. I can just fill my districts over there. Like like I said, um the main thing is you can play around this downside. So all things considered, land down under is like incredible. It's incredibly strong. It's consistent. It's like universal. Oh, and I didn't even mention <laughs> the plus three housing. Housing is like the most important thing you can get most of the time. Food, I've said this before, food doesn't really matter that much. It's really easy to get more food if you need it. It's really hard to get more to get more housing if you need it. So housing is just super strong. And especially in the early game, if you found a coastal city without a granary, um, having this extra housing just really, really helps that city get online. So hey, you already have this insane adjacency bonus. Hey, why not have like three free housing in like all your coastal states? Just take that, you know. Like you're not strong enough, Australia. Here, just have some free housing. Oh, and by the way, pastures trigger culture bombs. Because why not, right? You know, this this bonus isn't good enough. Let's think of something to add. Oh yeah, culture bombing. 
granted, like, that's very minor, right? Like, I don't see any pastures in my capital here. Um, you can kind of plan your cities around it. So let's say someone has a, like, an enemy has a pasture next to their city, and you settle that, and you culture bomb them. That's pretty obnoxious. That's, it's very rare, so obviously this is the smallest bonus within Land Down Under. But, like, Land Down Under is so strong, why do they need culture bombs, too? Like, that's all I'm saying, all right? So anyway, Land Down Under, like, insanely strong. And that's just their first bonus that I'm talking about here. I haven't even gone to Outback Stations and Citadel of Civilization. Anyway, let's move on to Outback Stations, right? Outback Stations. So it takes a while to get them online because it takes all the way into early medieval era. I'm sorry, late medieval era when you get guilds. So it takes a while. So you're not going to have these in the early game. You're just going to be building farms, whatever, lumber mills on your flat tiles. Outback Station. Plus one food, plus one production, plus one food for adjacent pasture, plus 0.5 housing. So the key thing to think the the key thing to consider here, and I'll get to the rest of it. It does get extra bonuses later. The key thing is you put this on flat land. That's the most important part. Flat land. So when you're building any normal city, you have your hills and your resources, and you have your flat land. And the hills and the resources are what matter. Because it's very, very easy to get housing capped in this game. You don't need that much food to be housing capped. Like, this city is grassland. It has plenty of food. It's going to be housing capped very, very soon. What is this? Oh, never mind. <laughs> I was literally confused for a second. I'm getting distracted. Anyway, you have plenty of food. So what really matters is these mines. So I'm going to build a mine here. I'm going to build a mine here. I'm going to work those mines, yada, yada. And so the question is, what do you do with your plain old... And obviously, I want to keep this. This is plenty of food. I want to use this to help me get to my housing cap. But what do I, what do I want to do with this? What do I want to do with this flat land? It's too... It's just too food. Like, that sucks on its own. The, the, um, let's set aside, like, districts, right? Like, a flat tile is a pretty good place to build a district because it's not very good to work it, right? Might as well throw a district there on a flat tile. But anyway, let's set aside districts for now. And let's just say... What do I want to build here? Well, uh, my, pretty much my option, if I'm any other civ, is a farm. Yay. Okay, I'm going to farm here. This is the farm symbol, because you should not build farms. <laughs> anyway, uh, put a farm here. That's great. It goes from two food to three food. This hill, even without, without a mine on it, is better than that. A hill without a mine is better than a, is better than a, a farm to work. Because one production is much, much stronger than one food, because you don't need that much food to get housing capped, and production is what really matters. Production is what gets you everything you'll need to win the game. Production is what actually makes the city the city. It, it's what gets you everything here. It gets what gets you everything that you need to build. Production, production. You always want production. So farms kind of suck. Um, why would I want like I don't I don't care about this. Like sure, if I build two farms, I'll get a housing. But I'll have two shitty tiles, part of my French. Two crappy tiles that I don't want to work. And I'll get just I'll have to use two builder charges for one housing. Like that's pretty expensive. Um and the housing is the best part of that, right? But like it just feels so painful to use two thirds of a builder for one housing. Especially since most of the time I'm going to be putting my districts on these flatland tiles and I'm not going to have enough, like enough space here to have a bunch of farms and have my districts and have my mines. Like that's a lot of builders, that's a lot of tiles you need. But here's the thing with Australia, right? Why, why have a, a three food tile farm when I could have a three food and one production tile? Right? So here's the thing. Australia can make use of these flat tiles so much better than every other sieve. Right? So why have a three food tile when I can have a three food one production? All of a sudden, that one production makes this tile so much better to work. And here's the thing. There's no reason to build farms anymore because not only are you getting the production, but this gives housing. 0.5 housing from Outback Stations. So it's just as much housing from a farm. It's just as much food as a farm. It gets... It gives you a production. So literally, Australia can take advantage of flat tiles 
so much better than every other Civ because Outback stations are so strong. Oh, and by the way, later in the game, right? Let's say I, I hey, you know, I want to boost my farms. When I get to feudalism, now I get plus one food for my farms with every for every farm triangle I build. So if you don't know what that means, is it's like two adjacent farms aren't enough. You need three adjacent farms. Yeah, I can't build it on Tundra, but I'm just using this little triangle as an example. If I build three adjacent farms, each of those farms will get a plus one. Again, I don't need that much food. I have plenty of food. Right? And by the way, Outback stations also get boosted later. I didn't even mention that at any given point, an Outback station gets plus one food for every adjacent pasture. So if you find some pastures, then right when you get Outback stations, you're, they'll have plus one food and plus one production, or plus two food, plus one production for adjacent pastures. Later, when you get some techs here, Steam power, you'll get production for every two Outback stations, so you can build them in little clusters. And then you get even more food later in the game with rapid deployment. So basically, the bottom line is Outback stations are... are Every other sim in the game kind of hates flat tiles. Like, flat tiles kind of suck. But for Australia, they're not just usable, they're pretty good. Like, they're pretty good tiles. Flat tiles with Outback stations are pretty solid. You can work them, you get housing, so you can use that food you're getting. Pretty solid investment. So out, Outback Stations, two thumbs up. Very, very strong. I think they're the best improvement in the game. Um, Indonesia's new improvement is pretty solid too. Kampong, that's pretty cool. Um, but they're much more situational. You need to have coastal resources. Um, and step wells, India's step wells are good. But um, I think Australia's Outback Stations are at least tied for the best improvement in the game. So, we've gone through two of their bonuses. Land Down Under, incredibly strong. Incredibly strong. Outback Stations, very strong. Let Australia take advantage of flat land the way no other civilization can. And that's just two here. So now we're going to talk about Citadel of Civilization. Plus 100% production if either they have received a declaration of war in the past 10 turns, or if they have liberated a city in the past 20 turns. So let me just put this out there, though. Double, double production, empire-wide. Double production, empire-wide. When you just take that in isolation, that is so unbelievably overpowered. It is so broken beyond belief. But, of course, of course, this situation doesn't come along all that often. So it seems. Right? So, um, there's only so many times you're going to be attacked per game, right? Hypothetically. It only lasts 10 turns, so not super long. And liberating cities, hypothetically, doesn't come along all that often. But think of it this way. This rewards a certain, a certain playstyle. You might think, hey, um, I get a bonus if I'm attacked. Like, right, the, the thing that comes to mind, right, is I'm attacked, I'm not ready. I need to build an army to defend myself as quickly as possible. That's what you think of when you say double production for 10 turns after you're attacked, right? You can whip up some walls, you can whip up some units. Um, but here's the thing, right? It actually rewards an aggressive playstyle. If you build a, a bunch of military units as Australia, and you go marching around attacking people, first of all, everyone's going to hate you. But that's okay, because you're really strong. You're OP. And if you have a big army you're pretty safe, right? If you're investing in military on single player, you're the big bad wolf, pretty much. Like, and if a bunch of civs denounce you and hate you, and then they declare a war on you, they're not, they're making you double OP. <laughs> they're doubling your production empire-wide. That's good. If you make everybody hate you, that's good, because <laughs> they're going to declare war on you. And it's going to get um, doubly boosted. And one thing I wish I could remember is I can't remember if city-states count. Because city-states declare a war on you if they ally with an enemy while you're at war. So if you're at war with somebody and they get a city-state ally, the city-state will declare a war on you. I can't remember if that boosts it. But regardless, that's kind of an important detail that I would really like to know the answer to. Um, but regardless, if you're getting declared on a bunch of times, 
hey, that's great. If you're pissing off everybody and they hate you and they declare them with you, that's double production, baby. That's so good. That's so good. That's insanely strong. And here's the last thing here. Plus tw uh, 20 turns of double production empire-wide for liberating. And you might be saying, mm, you know, wow, that's, that's pretty cool, but how often do I liberate, right? Well, <laughs> let me tell you. So people, and this is true in single player and multiplayer, um, city-states are food oftentimes. A ton of people capture city-states, right? The AI likes to kill city-states. They're very weak. Um, in multiplayer, people like to capture city-states. There's really no downsides. So there's going to be all these city-states sitting there just waiting for you to liberate them. So if you play aggressive, you have a big army, you go marching around the world fighting people. First of all, they're going to hate you. They're going to declare war on you all the time, hopefully, giving you double production. And if you march around liberating cities, you can literally perma-chain this bonus. If you are, are smart and you set it up, so that every 20 turns, you liberate a city. This is not nearly as hard as it sounds. I'm going to try to show it off, how to do it. Basically, just it's about just crunching the numbers and having your units in position where they need to be. And it sounds difficult, right? But if you do this correctly, your empire has double production, like perma-double production empire-wide. If you just position your units so you can chain liberate, because 20 turns is a n plenty of time to march units around, get them where they need to be, right? To liberate a city-state. Sure, you might have to declare more, war on more, one person, more than one person at a time, but that's okay because you have double production empire-wide. You have land down under. You have outback stations. You're the big bad wolf. So if you, if you execute this right, you can, like, hypothetically, like, chain liberations and get double production for the entire game. So if, if you haven't like gotten the memo yet, this sim is so good. Let's say land down under, right? Let's say you don't even have any breathtaking tiles. Like you get really unlucky or you're dumb and you don't you don't use this. You still get a consistent decent bonus. Housing, coastal cities, um, charming tiles. You're always going to get charming tiles. They boost your districts. Outback stations are always going to be useful. Even if you don't build that many, they're better than farms. Just straight upgrade to farms that only you get. And let's say you don't even you don't even attack people, you're still gonna get the bonus um, when you get when you get attacked, right? It's still gonna happen once in a while. It'll keep you safe. If you never attack people and you're you're attacked as Australia, you're gonna get double production. Your walls are gonna be up instantly. Your your archers or whatever you need are gonna be up instantly. You're good. You know, that alone is super strong. And then what I what I've just discussed, everything I've just discussed, the potential for the civilization is incredible if you play them right and so i i highly recommend you get good with australia because if you get good with if like everybody gets good with australia and they win every game then fraxis will have to notice and nerf them <laughs> um yeah i'm gonna I'll, last but not least i mean last and probably least no offense digger um is the digger unit uh it's a it's just a straight upgrade to infantry Infantry have 70 melee strength, diggers have 72, and they have a couple bonuses. So two is obviously not great. They cost the same, t they come at the same time, so don't worry about that. Plus 10 in coast, um, that's that's kind of, that's a t plus 10 is really strong, but um, fighting next to coast isn't that common. It's kind of like Japan's bonus. It's a little, it's a little awkward. Because like you don't really want to be sitting melee units on the coast, because they're just going to be getting shot by by ships, or there's like that's not really where they want to be, you know. But whatever, that that's that's fine. Like it's not it's not a negative. That's not a negative, you know. It's still like a straight upgrade to infantry, and plus five when you're in foreign territory. So this just plays into their Australia's um, incentives to be aggressive, to like piss people off, to liberate cities. And it's just a straight upgrade, right? Like you don't have to go out of your way for for this. You don't have to. It doesn't. It doesn't really matter if you like, in terms of like timing, because you're upgrading musket men into infantry, and then that's the only melee unit you need for until you get all the way up to um, 
where is it, mech infantry, right? So they remain relevant for a very long time. Like they're quite strong. Like they're just pretty solid, you know. They'll they'll make a good they'll make a good um frontliners for your artillery. So you can just go around like destroying every everything. They're not amazing by any means, but they're just like a straight upgrade. And that's just on top of everything else that Australia has, right? So the bottom line is Australia is super powerful. Hopefully I was able to communicate why and demonstrate their potential. They have consistent core bonuses. You can literally play them almost any way you want because no matter what victory you're going for, you need food, you need production, you need adjacency bonuses. They have all that, that you need housing. Um, and I'll say one final time, the way you truly break the game is you take advantage of liberation. So you try to chain liberation. And if you do that, like, you're just going to massacre the entire rest of the world every time. Anyway, that's um, that's it for my little intro here. Let's see how long was that? Oh yeah, that was pretty long. <laughs> um, I will. Gonna, I'm gonna be continuing. I I don't want to just like have a one and done video. I'm gonna play this game out and I'm gonna try to show off how to play Australia to their full potential. So my plan is to do like a little bit of a live com at the beginning, and then I'm gonna do kind of check-ins, like segments where I talk about the like I might do one like check in when I hit the classical era, check in like once per era, something like that. That way it's not just like all this empty time of let's playing. But yeah, um I hope you enjoyed this little intro to Australia. I hope you've learned something. And if you learned something, please hit like. That would be uh, appreciated. If you if you think I'm handsome, uh please hit dislike. Um I'll appreciate that as well. And yeah, um, hope you liked it. Hope to see you in the next video.